Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Mitch Favau Zuckerman. He is an assistant research professor at the University of Arizona with Biosphere 2 and has a joint appointment as assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Mitch is an ecosystem ecologist focusing on the responses of ecosystems to urbanization, land use change, and climate change. He has active research projects that investigate, one, the ecosystem services and biogeochemical cycling of green infrastructure. You're going to hear a lot about that. Uh, two, the influence of urbanization on the eco-hydrology and functional ecology of soils. Three, the resilience of arid riparian socio-ecological systems to global change. And four, the use of digital imagery to assess ecosystem responses to environmental change. He also works at the interface of science and public outreach, using citizen science programs to investigate questions relating to environmental literacy and ecological resilience. Mitch holds a PhD in ecology from the University of Georgia and an MS in plant and soil sciences from the University of Tennessee. He's also the director of an NSF-funded research experiences for undergraduates program at Biosphere 2. Um, so, without further ado, I will hand it over to Mitch for his presentation. Great. Thanks, Tori. And I want to thank Tori and Catlow and Watershed Management Group for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all today. It's really exciting to see such a big interest in soils and uh, green infrastructure. So it's great to see you all out there in cyberspace. Welcome to uh, Tucson, where it's overcast and slightly uh, humid from the rain that we had this morning, which was great. I'm going to talk about soil's role in um, processing pollutants and green infrastructure and a little bit on carbon sequestration. And um, I'm going to pause at certain points so that we can uh, take questions if you have any that you'd be typing into that um, public chat box that's over there in the corner. Um, I'm going to start off with this quote from a book from the early 1900s, The Decline of the West, and uh, he says, in place of a true type people born and grown on the soil, there's a new type of nomad cohering unstably in fluid masses, the parasitical city dweller. And this is generally the typical impression of cities and how people relate to nature in urban places. And it's something that I'm hoping to try to counter with the work that I do and the, the collaborations that we have with groups like Watershed Management Group that try to uh, show that you can have nature in cities and that you can reinvest people back into their, their own places even though they live in an urban landscape. And what we're going to be covering today is a short introduction to soils and soil food webs, uh, move into talking about the nature of the urban environment and how that impacts uh, soils and ecology. I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between soils, green infrastructure, and uh, management, and then move into some case studies uh, that look at work that I've been doing here in Tucson, partly with Watershed Management Group. Um, and So without getting into too much detail, we can look at what soil actually is. And soil is a combination of several different um, parts of our environment. Soil is the interaction of uh, rock, this uh, lithosphere that we see here. It's an interaction of water. It's an interaction of uh, gases in the atmosphere. And importantly, it's the interaction of the biosphere, the, inter the, the living parts of things. And these come together to form soil. So soil isn't this sort of inert, dead thing uh, that's out in the environment that plants grow on and is just sort of a medium for production. It's actually something that is the production of these organisms and the plants that feed into them and their interaction with their abiotic environment. And we can modify soils uh, for better or for worse to take advantage of these interactions and, and sort of shift what that environment might look at. My perspective on using soils and looking at soils comes from a, a soil food web base. So I'm focused more on the, the biological and the ecological part of it. And this is a, a typical food web model which shows us the different parts of the soil food web, the different compartments. Um, so at the base, we have what's feeding 
uh, the rest of the food web, we have plant roots and dead organic matter. And then going up into that food web, we have things like bacteria and fungi that feed on that organic material, and then all of the microscopic organisms, and then moving to the macroscopic organisms that feed off of those. The organisms that make up the soil food web are really important to us for how a soil is going to function and how it may be able to do certain things and provide uh, a good medium for plant growth or for doing nutrient cycling. And those functions that we get out of the food web vary as we move kind of from level to level. So at the base of this web where we have microscopic organisms that are interacting with plant roots and organic material, we have the, the role of decomposition is most important. So breaking down that plant material into other forms, uh, either physically or chemistry, chemically. Um, and then as we move into the web a little bit, we get into these creatures like protozoans and nematodes and small arthropods that are really important in regulating the population of these microscopic organisms through predation effects. And then as we get into the larger organisms, their role really is in uh, changing sort of the physical environment of soils. So they are important for breaking down uh, leaf material into smaller sizes so they can fragment litter. They can also change pore space and how soil is aerated by moving through the soil column and actually burrowing through um, the soil. When we talk about soils and food webs, it's important to recognize that what is happening in terms of process that we're interested in, so decomposition or uh, transformation of nitrogen or any of these kind of functional characteristics we're interested in happen only in, um, the, in certain pockets of the environment. So we have um, the idea that we have hot spots of activity in the soil. So we may have um, different kind of uh, a hierarchy of those different hot spots here. Um, you can see uh, the sort of detritus or where the litter actually is. Um, what's called the rhizosphere here, so where the roots are moving through. These are all places where there's a concentration of organic material from the plants that are feeding into it and a concentration of soil organisms. So these hotspots actually make up only about 10% of the volume of a soil when you take, take a look at it from a volume perspective. But that's where almost all of the activity that's going to happen. And it's biological activity that's important for transforming nutrients and sequestering carbon. This next figure is a little busy, and um, we don't need to pay attention to all of the details here. But it's important to point out to us that different ecosystems and different environments are very different. So we're looking at um, data about different parts of the soil food web, so bacteria and fungi, a few microscopic organisms, and earthworms. And how that varies as you move from a forest in Sweden to a grass prairie in Colorado to two different agricultural systems in Georgia. And the real important take home points here is that the types of organisms that are dominant in those different systems are variable. So whether you're in a forest system in Sweden or whether you're in a grassland prairie in Colorado is going to determine whether that food web is dominated by either bacteria or fungi as the primary uh, microbial decomposers. And that has a real important implication for the functional ecology and how transformations actually happen. So as you start to think about how you might use soils and soil ecological knowledge in your local systems, you need to think about what that kind of natural or background state might be. It doesn't make sense to think a lot about earthworms in these forests in Sweden relative to um, maybe the systems that we see in the southern part of the United States. OK, so before we move on to uh, talking about the urban environment, we can pause for questions if there are any. So if you're feeding them into the chat box, we can take them there. Let's see. Why? OK, and I'm assuming you all can see the questions that are there, but I'll repeat it. Why are the tons of bacteria in the Scotch pine forest so low? Um, we can go back to that figure. And part of the reason for that is because of the type 
of material that's feeding into the soil food web. And the Scotch pine forest has a lot of the, the plant material that makes it into the soil, has a lot of um, relatively hard to decompose uh, substances in it. So a lot of structural compounds like lignin and cellulose in leaf and wood tissue. And that's something that fungi predominantly have the ability to decompose. So the kind of food resource in the environment selects for that kind of um, presence. We have a high, high abundance of bacteria in the short grass prairie in Colorado, partly because there's so much of the material that makes it into the soil comes in through the roots and a lot of that is relatively easy to degrade and that's going to drive a bacterially dominated system. Um, let's see, we have a question from Erica. How does the biomass of organisms link to inorganic nutrients? Um, that is something that varies from place to place. So we know, um, for example, in forest systems that we have a lot of um, thing, micronutrients like even um, calcium and magnesium that may drive the presence or absence of different organisms. So there are kind of nutrient requirements or things that are required in structural parts of um, the tissue that of, of these organisms that may be present or not um, that can drive their, their abundance there. Um, and then let's just say, what does uh, the biomass in the Sonoran Desert look like in comparison to these four examples? Uh, the Sonoran Desert biomass is, is much greatly reduced. So um, in desert systems, we don't have quite as much productivity feeding into the soil. So we have a lot less resources to support things. We tend to be more bacterially dominated. We don't have as strong a presence of earthworms. Um, things are, tend to be drier, so we don't have as much protozoa relative to the nematodes. Um, we're missing on this figure the presence of ants and termites, which are much more important here as sort of macroorganisms than earthworms would be. Um, so let's move on to talking about the nature of the urban environment. Uh, and most of you are familiar with different kind of concerns that we might have or environmental impacts. Uh, cities can influence soils through changes in composition. Uh, they can influence soils through um, changing the quality of that soil by putting um, pollutants or different nutrients in. So we can have brake dust wearing off and tire dust kind of making it into our soils. We also have urban heat island effects. So the idea that the in, inner parts of the city uh, tend to be warmer than uh, the suburbs and the rural areas surrounding them, partly because of storage of heat, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then also um, something that's really common is just the sealing of soil. So either physically or chemically, we can put something on the surface of soil in cities like pavement or asphalt that blocks everything below it from interacting with the hydrology and biology above. And we can look at some of the more specific effects that we have. And these are all things to consider as we're talking about green infrastructure and how we might want soils to function. Uh, generally, we will find if you start digging an urban soil profile or digging down and making a pit that soils tend to be highly disturbed in cities and they might even be something that's sort of made or constructed by the people that live there. So what we see here in these pictures on the right are a couple of soil profiles going from uh, the surface horizon here down into the depth. So this is showing you um, 60 centimeters down on both of these. And you can see stuck into these profiles chunks of brick, chunks of uh, building construction. Um, if we look on these pictures over here on the left, what the trowel is pointing at here is that's at one point was the sort of natural surface of the soil. And as they came in to do construction, they put this layer of fill above that. So you're sort of separating what naturally would be there and the organisms in that from uh, the plant environment above. And we've got a really good picture of just a huge chunk of building debris stuck here in this soil profile. So the presence of all of these different physical components can influence the ability of organisms to move through. It can influence the decomposition processes. And it just fundamentally changes the urban soil type away from uh, what the kind of background soil conditions might be. So if you're going out to do a project and you want to do a site assessment, generally soil maps are going to be very useless in cities because of all of these sort of local scale construction effects that we have. Another common urban problem is compaction. 
Um, so the process of doing construction, compact soil down, um, putting soil in sort of small spaces between pavement and streets causes the space between the soil particles, so the physical parts of the soil, get smooshed together and there's a lot less um, space for air and a lot less space for water and also organic matter and that's what we're seeing down here on the bottom. That a compacted soil has pr primarily made up, almost three quarters of it, is sort of the physical mineral parts of soil when a more natural soil might have a more even um, balance of air and water space and allows for roots to move through, allows for water to move through, and allows for all this sort of interactive space that we might be interested in uh, that will do stuff for us. Climate's important, so this is a, um, a figure from a study that was done in Marana, which is a suburb of Tucson, relatively small space, uh, small city, but even with a city that small, we we're seeing an elevation in air temperature of a degree and a half Celsius, or about three or four degrees Fahrenheit, and that can have real important implications for the functioning of plants, so in a drought environment, the hotter it gets the more water plants are going to have to use, so this is important for us here. Um, but it also shifts the ecology of the soil organisms themselves. So if it's warmer, we tend to see biological activity rates go up for microbes. We tend to see um, nutrient cycling rates and processes start to speed up a little bit in response to this. So things might get a little bit out of um, pace with what we normally would see. We also have a strong impact of um, chemical um, pollutants in cities, and this is showing you two different uh, gradients going from downtown New York City, um, from Central Park out towards the suburbs, and then from downtown Louisville, Kentucky, showing you the percentage of um, concentrations above kind of this rural baseline for a couple of common heavy metals. And we can see that there's an elevation in concentrations in the city core and it decreases as you move away. And we see something common like that from city to city. The magnitude of that increase might vary with city size. So Louisville's a bit, little bit smaller, so we don't have such a significant increase, but it is sort of an elevation there. And we see this for metals, we see this for nitrogen deposition. So the chemistry that our organisms and our soils are experiencing is gonna be different as well. And it might be something like these metals which can impact and impair biological function. Then we also have biological impacts themselves. So the introdu introduction of species, um, which we're seeing on the left, the introduction of earthworms into some cities in the Northeast is causing entire forest floors to be denuded of litter. So these earthworms are great at breaking that down and it completely transforms the ecosystems. This is from a park inside of uh, Chicago. And it can also shift that balance of bacteria versus fungi, which would greatly change the rates at which uh, decomposition happens and can change the rates of uh, nutrient cycling processes that we're interested in. So by changing the physical and chemical environments, we can shift um, what these bi biota are doing and what their presence and abundance looks like. And then uh, finally, this table is here to just remind us that different cities are going to have different effects on their local ecosystems. So we're comparing uh, three different cities that exist over um, several, uh, over, over three orders of magnitude. So New York City at about seven and a half million, Baltimore at about um, 650,000 people, and Asheville, North Carolina at about 61,000 people. We still see an elevation or, or a change in conditions and soils as we move from the rural part of the landscape to the urban part, but those differences aren't always manifesting themselves in the same way. So we're seeing um, perhaps differences in decomposition rates um, from city, city to city um, that are significant, but the temperature changes might be even greater. So we're only seeing maybe a degree difference in Asheville, but closer to four degrees difference in New York City. So all of these local impacts are going to kind of play themselves out differently. So as we think about, wow, what's the problem with the soils that I'm working with, it's always important to look locally and sort of do a site assessment and study what's happening in your particular place, in your particular city. Don't take a, a sort of urban context for granted just because you read a study that said London has this amount of organic matter in its soils. You should always check things locally. And with that, we can take a couple more questions um, before moving into the next short section, or if there aren't questions, we can move on.
Okay. And so when we're going to talk a little bit about management, um, so we have these problems in cities, but we also have lots of opportunities to use soil for restoration, uh, to reclaim sites. We can use them in uh, novel design or, or novel ecosystems like um, the Highline, uh, Highline in New York City, putting in green infrastructure basins or green roofs. Um, there's lots of places that we can um, do management. And usually our goals related to doing these different types of um, green infrastructure elements relates to the idea of ecosystem services. The, the notion that the ecological systems around us provide different things to us that we need to, um, uh, to live off of for sort of life support, but also support us economically and culturally. So this is a typical kind of breakdown of what these services might be, if you're not familiar with this schema. So there's the idea that they're supporting services and supporting processes. So these are the parts of the ecosystem that provide kind of the foundation for everything else. So we have production by plants, we have the cycling of nutrients, we have the formation of soil as um, microbes break down and weather rock and break down leaf material and mix that together to form soil. And then all of these support different kinds of services. So we have provisioning services and these are the goods and um, tangible things that we can get out of a system that we can eat or sell. So food or fiber or, or fuel if we want to um, kind of um, burn wood in our, in our environment or from our environment. We have regulating services, and these are things that keep um, our environment within certain limits or ranges so we can modulate um, the flow of water, perhaps, and having a, a buffer forest along a stream might regulate the flooding regimes that happen there. So that's a service that that forest might provide. Um, or the removal of nutrients from, from uh, storm polluted water, storm water. We also have cultural services, like um, the role of um, ecosystems in our environment for recreation or spiritual use or just having something aesthetic, having something green or, or living in our landscape might be important to us. And these are all underlain um, by the presence of soil. We're not going to have plant production without soil for the plants to grow in. We're not going to have nutrient cycling without soil for the organisms in there to break down those materials and transform them. So this review um, that I'm citing here goes into a couple of different types of ecosystem services in uh, cities and urban environments and talks about the potential magnitude that they might have. So the impact of a city on sequestering carbon into it might be relatively low um, because we may not have a lot of actual space um, in our landscape. So think about sort of the size of a city versus what it's um, kind of surrounded by that's not developed. Um, so very low ability to sort of impact carbon levels in the atmosphere, but we, we have a low amount of uncertainty about that. So we think we know a lot about how carbon sequestered. We know a lot about the relationship between land use and cover. Um, Another thing that we're going to talk about later on is looking at water quality and stormwater quality. So um, we have a relatively high magnitude of impact if we're able to do that. So we can put ecosystem services back in that will pull um, pollutants out of water quality, but we have a relatively high degree of uncertainty about how that works. So we don't really know perhaps at the very local scale how that works or how things might interact with local vegetation, local soils, or any particular type of pollutant. So our understanding about nitrogen might be different than how we understand uh, lead, for example. Now uh, this paper also introduces an idea that's interesting, uh, the notion of ecosystem disservices. So these are negative things that might come out. Um, they talk about water use, perhaps. So if you want to grow something in your city, you're going to have to get water from somewhere to do that. Um, that's something that these green infrastructure installations that we work with try to combat. Um, let's move on. Um, in terms of management, one of the key things that we can think about is that relationship between uh, kind of compact soils and living soils. So bulk density is one measure on uh, this axis of bulk density. The more soil you have packed into a space, so the tighter and more compacted it is. And generally, we find that the more compact a soil is, the less organic matter we have. So the, if we're interested in managing for 
um, biology and soils and having high productive soils perhaps in cities, we have to sort of manage this relationship. We want to try to decrease the density that soil has and increase organic matter contents in the soil. And that's, that's a key place where we try to do management by bringing organics back in. So some of the things that Tori talked about early on using um, things that we think of as waste products like um, human waste and um, tree clippings are things we can introduce back in. And what we can do is use this to support different functions that the soil food web might have for us. So we can support chemical things like the cycling of nutrients and retention of nutrients or the sequestering of carbon. We can also manage physical types of benefits so we can improve infiltration or work on the structure, the physical structure of soil by changing what the biology looks like. And then we can also have biotic impacts. We can increase the biodiversity where we are. We may be able to suppress disease and that might be diseases for people, but it might also be pests for the plants uh, that we're interested in. So we can use notions of biocontrol and um, try to work with that. Uh, so that was just a brief look at management kind of ideas and what we're trying to get soils and green infrastructure to do, this idea that they can provide different services for us. Um, if we have questions, we can take some, and it doesn't look like we do. Uh, someone's very excited about mycorrhizae, which they should be, because they're great little soil critters that do a lot of work for us. Um, so we'll move on and talk about case studies looking at um, pollution. and. Um, we're, we're kind of setting this up as the idea that we can install green infrastructure in our landscape, like the, the use of rain gardens. And what we're looking at here is your typical rain garden, which is just a kind of planted depression um, in the landscape. We have an opening in uh, the curb that allows water to flow into that depression. And the idea is that this is going to process nutrients for us and process pollutants. So we have a table here on um, the right showing us estimation based upon lab studies and field work on how well a retention basin or, or rain garden might be at removing phosphorus, removing metals, and removing other parts of uh, stormwater pollution that we're interested in. And this is the model that we have for doing green infrastructure with respect to stormwater management. And a lot of this work is being done in relatively um, temperate and music environments, uh, places where water is relatively well available. And one of the questions we have is how well do these concepts and ideas function in a relatively different um, environment? So in a desert ecosystem, if you're not from here, you probably are thinking of something like this picture up in the top, but when it rains here, it really rains. We get a seriously intense um, high energy storm systems in the summer that can dump maybe an inch or so of rain in a couple of hours on the landscape and then the ecology here has evolved uh, and been selected for the ability to handle this. So this little conceptual figure on the side is showing us that the rain that comes in is actually triggering biological growth, which is sort of a pulse of biology. And that provides this reserve that allows organisms to ride out uh, the dry periods in between. So we have this sort of pulse reserve, this sort of on off with the soil biology, this kind of flashy system that comes in and out. And we want to know if we have this kind of environment for the green infrastructure, will they still do the sort of functions that we're interested in? So when it does rain, we do see water moving through the street, we do see water moving into basins, and this is sort of an example of what they look like here, reflecting native vegetation, so um, leguminous shrubs and a sort of understory of bunch grasses and perhaps some cacti. Um, how well do these things function um, with respect to these ecosystem services that we're interested in and um, what are they actually doing for us? And that's kind of where I got interested in working with the installations that Watershed Management Group has. This idea that by breaking up the curb like we see over here, the same way um, we saw in the kind of East Coast pictures, 
this little chunk out in the curb allows stormwater to flow in, irrigate these basins, and perhaps let the soils do what we hope they would in, in uh, bioretention settings. We're reconnecting hydrology in the city. And the questions I had were, how does the import of stormwater into these basins impact soil quality? How does it impact ecosystem function and perhaps even the services that we're hoping to get out of there? And we have two competing forces coming here. So as, this, as the streets are sitting um, relatively dry, they're accumulating um, different heavy metals coming off of cars. They're uh, accumulating nitrogen that's coming out of exhaust. So there's sort of this pool of potentially harmful things that get flushed into these basins uh, when it does rain. And that's something that may negatively impact um, the soils, but at the same time, we're adding plant mat material in there, we're adding productivity, and we're concentrating water in the landscape. So we may actually have a benefit um, from that. So we're initial, initially looking to see what the sort of balance of that is. So we have two competing hypotheses or, um, here that we could measure something about the soil in terms of its quality for providing services. So maybe it's the organic matter content, maybe it's something biological that's going to do transformations. And if the rain gardens are going to improve soil quality, the, the data might look something like this. So if we compare a native desert soil with an urban soil that doesn't have green infrastructure with the green infrastructure elements, we might get kind of this um, positive effect. And that we might have this sort of negative cascade if the presence of metals in the soil are going to further degrade the urban quality by concentrating um, heavy metals in the soil. We might see sort of a, a decrease in this uh, data set. So we can see some metrics that we're looking at um, in terms of different forms of carbon in the environment. So uh, labile carbon, which is a, a lab assay that we do that tells us something about relatively easy to break down carbon for feeding microbes, and we see an increase in that um, pool in the rain gardens. We see uh, an increase in organic matter content as well by having that concentration of plant life and water there. And we also see a relatively positive response from the microbial community, so just how much microbes are out there. So this is suggesting to us that even though there's metals moving through, the soil quality is still relatively good for providing services in these environments. Uh, one thing we did early on um, was to take soils from these different sites, bring them back into the lab, and then dump a solution of uh, heavy metals on them. So we made a broth of lead and cadmium and zinc and poured it on there and looked at how much activity we had from the microbes by hooking them up to an analyzer that measured their respiration. and. This is sort of scaled relative to each other, but the native soil microbes and the urban soil microbes that aren't getting the stormwater influx aren't really able to respire very well when we put the solution of metals on them. But the rain garden microbes are doing really well. They're highly active once we put that, that, that solution back onto them. So this is suggesting to us that in the rain garden setting, that constant kind of flux in of, of metals is perhaps leading to adaptation or maybe acclimation of the microbes. And we're looking at ways that we can sort of tease that apart, whether it's just something evolutionary in terms of what the populations look like or whether it's uh, something kind of physiological. But the key point here is that these urban soils and ecosystems are able to re recover relatively quickly from this, what we perceive as, as kind of a disturbed environment. Another thing I'm looking at in these soils are the composition of the soil nematode community. So these are microscopic roundworms that do different things based upon um, their body structure. So they have different roles in the food web, which is one reason why they're great bioindicators. They um, feed on, um, let's see, feed on bacteria. They feed on fungi, so they feed on microbes. They also are um, predatory or omnivorous, so they're a little bit higher up in the food web, and then they also um, feed on plants. So depending on what their position is in the food web, they might have different life histories, they might respond to the environment differently, and we're able to use the composition of these, um, the community of these organisms to tell us something about what a soil looks like. So we're able to see whether soil has a good food web structure or not, whether um, there's sort of the diversity of organisms we're looking for. 
And what we can compare here is the kind of composition of the soil nematode community in um, urban yards versus uh, rain garden basins. And one thing that um, we can look at that's interesting is that the relative abundance of all of the nematodes in the soil doesn't really vary uh, that greatly from site to site. But we see huge differences in the presence and abundance of kind of top predators and carnivorous nematodes in the food web. And importantly, we see a shift in um, the fungal feeder to bacterial feeder ratio. So this is telling us that by putting plant material in the rain gardens by bringing water in, we're increasing the amount of fungi in there to feed uh, sort of the rest of, to feed these fungal feeding nematodes that are out there. Um, so the data from this suggests to us that we're getting kind of better looking soils with respect to the, the food web that's out there. And there's another way we can look at these data. Um, this is kind of a busy figure, so I'll walk through it a little bit. This is sort of a matrix of um, hypothesized sites uh, or, or data from the literature, um, and we can bin them out into responses that are disturbed, um, relatively maturing, or a nice um, kind of matured structured system or something that's um, in a degraded state. And we bin this out based upon how the soil nematodes are, are in there. So things that are showing us um, relatively good food web structure, so the presence of omnivores and, and predators, not just things that feed at the base of the web, means you're going to have a score out um, closer to here. And this enrichment index is telling us something about how responsive those critters are to the influx of nitrogen or the influx of carbon, so resources that might kind of pulse through the soil food web. And soils that tend to be highly disturbed might have high amounts of this sort of kind of pulsing of things in and out. Um, so high concentrations and low concentrations at times. And what we see is this shift from the condition of the urban yard being in a relatively degraded state out towards a more structured kind of food web. So we're seeing from these indices that the food web structure is, is improving and we're getting kind of better environments biologically for doing ecosystem services and biological um, processing that we might be interested in. Um, when we try to link this to ecosystem function, we've looked at kind of nitrogen chemistry, and we can see that they're able to retain nitrogen a little bit better than urban soils around them. Um, but one thing that we um, started doing, uh, we can look at the relationship between um, how these basins are managed and not. So we're looking here at two different types of basins in town. Um, the one at the top has a nice um, layer of organic mulch built into it, and this one at the bottom is using rocks for mulch, and that's partly because when we have these big storm events come through, it's really easy for that high flush of water to, to take all of that organic mulch out. So we have a different, different couple of different sets of these through town, and when we look at the soil responses, we see differences between the two of them. So the soils that have the organic mulch on them tend to have larger populations of microbes, and that's what we're seeing um, over here. We have a higher microbial biomass of the organic mulch, and when we um, compare the rates of nitrogen mineralization, so how much nitrate and ammonium is being produced in those soils, we see that the production goes up with the rock mulch. So what we're thinking here is that the presence of organic mulch provides a carbon substrate for the microbes to grow, and as they grow, they retain mineral nitrogen, so we don't find it free in the soil. So having organic mulch is a great way to stimulate this microbial activity and allows us to kind of maintain this ecosystem service that we're interested in. Um, when we work with the nematode indices here again, um, the organic mulch tends to be in uh, a little bit better condition than the rock mulch. They both have higher food web structure, but that rock mulch doesn't have sort of an even supply of organic material in. It gets sort of this flashy response uh, to the environment that we see in the community structure. Um, and we're also starting to look at how well soils in town might be able to uh, retain um, metals and nitrogen uh, inputs. So we're doing these lab assays.
is where we take a known solution uh, in these bottles and we feed them through columns of soil from the environment and the type of soil and whether it has multinate changes, the infiltration rate at which water moves through the basins and it shifts the ability to pull um, different metals out or, or nitrate um, from the solution. So we're just now trying to think about how we might design basins in terms of their composition to get the functionality that we're interested in. So that was a, a look at some um, kind of biological and chemistry data that we've got from some of the basins. We can take some questions here. I see a couple of things out. Um, let's see. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there it is. How do engineered soils generally compare with native soils with regard to pollutant processing? Um, that's something that really varies from place to place. So in our environment, native soils tend to have relatively low organic matter contents and relatively low bio biological populations. So anything that we can do to improve that is, or, or improve that state is going to improve the pollutant processing. And that's what we're seeing with some of these basin studies. When we add mulch to them, it stimulates the growth of soil organisms, and it provides more organisms to do that processing that we're interested in. Um, See, we're looking at how long has the rain gardens been installed, and can you describe the soil that was originally installed in basins? Um, I think the basins that we're working with, um, with the mulch, were just installed in the last um, maybe three or four years in Rincon Heights, and the ones in Dunbar Springs go back maybe a decade or so. Yeah. Um, some of them vary a little bit. And I think the soil that goes into them is really just sort of what is naturally there. There isn't a whole lot of sort of design or construction in uh, like what the composition looks like. And that's something that our active research is trying to look at now. If you change what that composition looks like, so if you bring in something that has a lot less sand than our native soil does, does it function better? Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to look at. Um, See, there's another question about um, whether we've studied whether there's a tipping point in the biomass of fungi or types and root health of leguminous trees. And that's something we have not done. But it's, it's a really interesting question. It's sort of like how you start pushing these systems with respect to management. When do you start to get to see the manifestation of these benefits? And that's something that as we start having more of these features in the landscape and studying them further, we're able to um, kind of do, do a better assessment of those sorts of things. Um, and hmm? oh, what family of organisms actually break down heavy metals, or is it a synergy of the whole? It's not really a breakdown. It's more a sort of sequestration of them. They sort of pull them into their tissues, and it's something that the plants are able to do as well. And it really is kind of um, a, a synergy of the whole, although some places we are seeing the ability, um, certain plants may have a higher ability um, to do that, or people are actually um, genetically engineering plants with a higher ability to retain metals. And a lot of that's being done for very heavily polluted sites like mine, um, tailings and mining sites. Um, we've got a couple of questions about maintenance uh, that's needed for the basins. And maintenance is something in these cases that is at the responsibility of the, the residents that are putting them in, the neighborhoods that are there. Um, and um, let's see, the, the idea of what kind of maintenance is needed through time, uh, sediment may accumulate, so that might be a problem. The growth of um, plants is pretty quick once you concentrate nutrients and water in this environment, so there's uh, weeding that has to happen and that can um, kind of sort of change the rate at which water infiltrates in, and it might change the ability of soils to do what we're interested in. So a lot of the programs I think that we're, we're thinking about now is how to design maintenance programs, how to use uh, the residents as sort of a citizen science approach to doing maintenance in their own environment, and how that might improve functionality. Um, so last, we're going to look at carbon sequestration. Um, and we already saw that the basins have 
uh, elevated carbon pools, which is, is a good indication that carbon sequestration is happening. Um, but in general, if you're not familiar with this concept, it's the idea that we can sequester carbon from the atmosphere and reduce atmospheric CO2 pools by bringing it into um, biology and into soils. So as plants grow, they need carbon dioxide to feed photosynthetic reactions, and then that is stored in their tissues as sugars. Um, so CO2 first has to go through the plants, and then it makes it into the soil through a variety of ways. So we have uh, litter fall that comes off. We may have the um, production of um, kind of sugars coming out of roots as they grow or the actual death of roots. And all of these things as they decompose feed into organic matter pools. So we have to have the plants present really to have a strong impact on soil carbon sequestration. And this figure up here in the corner is to remind me to say that we have a lot of the um, leaf material and um, kind of plant clippings that are grown in these basins and some of the neighborhoods are getting clipped and put right back in. So we're feeding the decomposition process to grow things back into these pools. Oh, okay, I'm going to move a little quicker because we're running out of time. Um, let's see, in general we know that soil carbon is going to increase in time as we do restoration. So this is showing us uh, restored prairie sites and here's what a virgin undisturbed prairie might look like and here's a trajectory through time. Um, and this is all driven by biology, so the production of like glues and, and substances that come off of roots and microbes hold soil together and bonds that carbon in there. We see something really similar in cities, and this is kind of a messy diagram, but um, let's see how we can simplify it. The soil carbon pools are shown in purple, yellow, and blue, and through time, looking at this um, part of the um, kind of front range in Colorado, the younger a site is, the less carbon there is. And so we see similar processes happening in cities. Um, generally, we think about how we can promote carbon sequestration, and it's the same ideas about how we might promote soil ecology in, in green infrastructure in general. So we might try to improve the amount of residue that goes back in the soil. We might try to minimize disturbance, try to keep roots, and try to mimic the natural system. Um, for cities, prescribed fire may not actually help us um, very much or be desirable. Um, but the ideas are still there, that trying to increase the amount of carbon and organic matter is going to help us. Generally, though, we have to think about variation in cities all the time. So different types of land use, like having grass or having um, um, different kinds of deposits may have higher carbon storage than uh, like a construction field, for example. What we're seeing here in our rain basins is that um, when we go out and we survey the landscape, and I've been able to go to some trees uh, that were planted about 25 years ago and measure what their size is like, and that's what we're seeing here, it's their diameter at chest height. Um, we're measuring what they look like here, and we're seeing trees that were planted in rain basins, um, like we're seeing in this picture, shown in red, and trees that were not planted in the basin, shown in blue. And they actually have a difference in size right now. Um, and models predict that that difference is going to diverge through time, um, such that by maybe at the end of their lifespan or 40, 50 years from when they were planted, the rain basins are going to support 33%, trees that are 33% larger. And that translates into a substantial difference in carbon sequestration in the tree and how much above ground biomass we actually see. Um, we're working now to try to characterize what the storage in the soil might be in response to this. So as we have these roots growing and more productivity moving in, is it actually feeding the soil itself or is it just sequestering in kind of that growth of the tree biomass? But this is really exciting to see that the basins actually are promoting um, kind of faster growth of the trees and sustaining that through time to the, um, to, to out into the future based upon these models. Uh, so. Let's see, to wrap up, um, I, I hope that you got from uh, this presentation a little bit about the importance of soil knowledge and the knowledge of soil ecology to promote urban ecosystem services, uh, things that we want in our landscape from green infrastructure. And this may be a great way for us to try to counter this nature deficit disorder, the idea that being in city separates us from nature. Um, obviously, things are not quite like that on the ground if we're able to put these features in our landscape. 
Um, we've got some more references if you want to, uh, pardon the pun, dig a little deeper into soil ecology, a couple of great um, textbooks and a couple of um, government resources. And I think we are out of time for questions, but if there are more, we can type them in and we'll answer them offline and on the web. Yeah, and I think um, there's a couple more questions. Thank you very much, Mitch, first of all. And I, I see two more questions. We can go a little over time to answer if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I can just go ahead and read them. I'm not sure they're still visible in the chat. Heidi asks, have you found that there are certain tree species that are better than others at either filtering or sequestering metals? Um, we haven't done work on that and partly, uh, mo mostly what's going out in the landscape that is trying to reflect sort of the, the natural um, plant diversity that's out there. So we haven't really done trials um, in this landscape to see what might be better or worse. Um, See. We had another question about um, some of the street trees in Tucson produce edible beans and seeds. And we've actually gone through um, and measured some of the mesquites in these basins and looked at the metal content in the bean pods that were grown in basin soils versus just sort of your background urban environment. And there's no elevation in um, in metal concentrations by being grown in these basins. So they're not sequestering metals into the parts of the tissues of plants that people are eating, which we, we think is really encouraging. We're, we're taking samples to look at other things that are being grown out there like cactus um, flowers and cactus pads and all of those other, all those other great urban foraging things that we can do in the environment. Um, let's see. Uh, Adam's asking, have similar studies been done in environments with higher rainfall? Uh, definitely, there's, there's a lot of great research coming out of uh, the Chesapeake Bay region and the EPA units in Cincinnati and a lot of work in kind of the upper Midwest on how rain gardens function. And that's really where this idea comes from and we're sort of translating this knowledge uh, and this kind of idea that they can do services for us um, other than just sort of holding water. So the idea of kind of engineering your landscape to berm it to hold water is nothing new in the desert. People have been doing it for, for a very, very long time. But the idea that we can use them to process stormwater and perhaps deal with pollution is something new that we're, that we're borrowing from these other environments. Um, Mitch, I think I only saw one additional question, and that okay. was from Mead. Uh, did you see results for E. coli? How old were the rain gardens and did you observe a tipping point? We have not looked at E. coli specifically, but we have um, some new colleagues here at the university that are able to do that. So we're looking to do that this summer um, in the storms that come through. Um, let's see, how old were the rain gardens? It varies, some are maybe four years old or so, and some are maybe a decade old. Um, and in terms of a tipping point, we don't really have um, a good trajectory in time to look at tipping points, I think. It really depends on what kind of data we're trying to think about. Um, we haven't really found a good sort of a transition. Um, we need a, a kind of a deeper study in time, and that's something hopefully we'll be able to generate as we go. Um, we're building some basins up at Biosphere 2 um, this spring that we'll kind of know what the beginning states were like and we'll be able to track those through time and have much better control over what um, goes into them and how they started and maybe we'll be able to identify those tipping points as we go from those kind of more controlled studies. Um, let's see. I can't really speak about zoning because I'm not involved with the installation, but I know we've had to work with the city on some of that to cut yeah. the curb. I can, am I unmuted? I can speak to that just a 
little bit. Um, this is Tori Syracuse with Watershed Management Group. We haven't run into specifically zoning issues. Um, our green infrastructure projects are generally approved by uh, the City of Tucson Department of Transportation. And so as long as we're meeting their engineering standards for safety and landscaping, um, we've been able to install these features. And they've been a key partner in helping us develop standard designs for approval that meet all those standards. Um, so uh, it hasn't been an issue uh, really here in Tucson with zoning. Um, I think at, actually at this point we have a lot of questions coming in, which is terrific, but um, we're going to go ahead and conclude the webinar. And Great. for those of you who didn't have questions answered, we will be sure to get back to you. Um, both my contact information and Mitch's contact information are there on your final slide, so I encourage you to keep in touch. Thanks very much to Mitch. We really appreciate your time and expertise mm -hmm. with this, and uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful Thursday afternoon and evening. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>